to do a, a, an exercise that is uh, actually very, well, one of the exercises that, is ver that are very important uh, in our community is trying to uh, talk to you about botnets from a different point of view. So not too technical, uh, but more on the, the side of people looking at those objects from the outside. And um, he's specifically going to look at the issue of uh, cyber insurance and the relation to uh, botnet related events, uh, botnet activities and so on in your networks and so on. So it's, uh, it's important that we uh, try and develop um, talks, exchange, papers, uh, anything that helps the different communities that work around botnet issues, not only from a technical point of view, but also from other points of view, economical, in this case, uh, sociological, uh, behaviorally speaking, whatever. So we need to uh, be looking at that uh, in, from very different uh, points of view. So uh, please uh, welcome Wayne's presentation. Uh, be ready for something that you might not be used to uh, in terms of content. And uh, Wayne, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Thank you very much. That was a great lead in. Yes. Uh, my slide is full of a lot of things like this because I figured you'd be in the crowd saying, why in the world are we hearing about cyber insurance? So um, there's quite a bit of, uh, I call it snoring is optional because I'm gonna be talking about a lot of things, there's gonna be a lot of graphics, so I add some fun things like this to try to lighten the mood. So please, I hope no one takes offense, and if you don't get my humor, that's fine. If you do, great. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about myself. I. Uh, I do not work in insurance. I never have. Um, my day job does work in the with an insurance provider, um, a major American insurance provider. I work at Risk Analytics. Um, a lot of this analysis is my own, and they are graciously supporting uh, the ability to do this. Um, I am not a broker, nor am I a lawyer, so do not take any of my presentation or words as advice on what you need to do. This is more of uh, to inform and enlighten. Okay, So I'm not here to unsell. I'm not here to tell you that you should buy insurance. I'm here to kind of give you the world's view of this and how you as researchers and analysts affect that. Okay, So I will give you a quick warning for those of you that cannot stand cyber. I'm going to be saying a lot of cyber. Okay, It's an industry term. I know, uh, trust me, making this presentation drove me crazy because the amount of cyber that's in it. So I'll just warn you. Um, so let's first talk about cybercrime, okay? Huge. You all have jobs because of it. We know that, right? Um, IBM's chairman uh, said that uh, cybercrime may be the greatest threat to every company in the world, right? Whether that's FUD or whether that's true, you know, it's said, and that's what decision makers look to. Um, cybercrime costs the global economy up to $450 billion annually. Okay? And that, that, that report was from a couple years ago, so looking at some other data, it's, it could be up to $600 billion. Um, a report out by Cybersecurity Ventures predicts that the global annual cybercrime costs will grow to $6 trillion by 2021. Okay? $6 trillion. Now, let's just say it's half that. That's still $3 trillion. Um, and in the U.S., the losses vary from 100 billion to 300 billion. Um, Lloyd's of London, uh, they claim that in the U.K., cybercrime has cost businesses up to 400 billion, and that includes direct damage plus uh, the disruptions and normal course of business issues, which usually aren't tracked through cyber insurance or the mechanism. Okay. Moving on. Uh, so Ponemon is thrown around a lot by decision makers. Whether or not you agree with uh, their analysis, it's something that is used heavily, uh, sponsored by major uh, security companies. So, you know, as you can see through the way they've tracked it, there's a consistency here of the average per capita, per capita cost, which basically saying a per record cost, okay? And over the last 10 years, you're varying from that 138 to 217. 
the, uh, the more recent report that, that came out a month ago, I believe, um, talks about the, the more records lost, the higher the cost of the data breach. Makes sense, right? Um, just gives you an idea of what people are looking at here and, and how malware or hackers or the, the botnets that they use affect these costs. Um, so why am I talking about cyber insurance? Um, I've been a big believer that insurance would drive the security and safety of the internet, much like it's done with other parts of our lives, whether that's automobile industry, uh, construction. Uh, I really think that you'll probably see one day where there's gonna be a gold, silver, or platinum plan for your business uh, or for some other mechanism that will be insured and there'll be kind of a standardized policy. But there'll be requisites, right? There'll be things that you have to have in place. Um, and the, and the quote here, uh, cyber insurance market could double to five billion in annual premiums by 2018, and uh, 7.5 billion by the end of the decade. That's, that's, that's a lot of money on the table, okay? So it is a major, major market out there. So what cyber events are covered? Uh, I had some questions last night at dinner about this, so here you go, all right? Um, of course, all the, all the stuff that we're familiar with, your, your uh, PII, uh, the different uh, bank cards. Um, so when it comes down to malware, it depends on the policy, right? Um, they may require some due diligence. Uh, there may be some other things that, uh, you know, depending on the, the policy, the broker, uh, the different companies, uh, they may want to do an evaluation of your environment, you know, depending on who you are. Um, of course, DDoS, um, you'll see later, it's surprising. DDoS is something that can be covered, but there's not a lot of claims. Um, and I think maybe that speaks to the services that are out there that companies already pay for, and they don't need to, to go into their deductible for the claim. Uh, hacking, typical. Um, so phishing attacks and BEC. Uh, does anybody here heard the term BEC before? Uh, the FBI coins basically what we know as a CEO scam as a, a business email compromise. That's their term for it. Um, and then, so cyber extortion deals with, of course, ransomware. Uh, there's also some other extortions, I guess, that could take place, but some companies who don't have a cyber insurance policy may already be able to cover a ransomware event through their typical K&R, which is their kidnap and ransom event. Ransom event. So some of you, I'm sure, work for a company that has insurance on you, and if you tr you're traveling for work, they'll have a policy on you for kidnap or ransom. And technically, you could use that same portion of your policy, and it's not a, right now, um, it's not a cyber policy, the K&R. That could be something you could use to say, hey, I want to use this K&R. And so here's the, here's the insight on that. There's no deductible for a K&R. So a lot of times when you do a claim, you've got to pay your deductible. Well, for ransomware, that deductible is now something off the table. So, and then of course, mistakes. So a cyber policy. Um, there's no real right way, I guess, right now. It's something that's evolved. I, I love this, this image here because uh, in my household, we have that whole, which way does the toilet paper go? So I figured this is a perfect scenario. Um, the policies are something that are evolving, right? So you have anywhere from 50 to 60 car uh, carriers, people that provide the insurance. There's possibly up to 63. Uh, there's no real hard number there. Um, the first cyber policy was written back in the dot-com era, um, probably when if, if some of you were still working or started working back in those days, you remember what that was like during that crash and the things that were going on. Um, uh, the difference being you have kind of a slow evolution over 17 years because of how the cyber world has evolved uh, versus 34 years of damage and liability. Been around for a while, a lot easier to, to put that uh, square peg in a square hole, all right? Um, so it is evolving year after year. Uh, the policies are usually issued on a yearly basis. And so there could be changes, there could be things that happen. A lot of times it dictates, for example, you have the, uh, the major retailer breaches that could really change the way your policy would be the following year, uh, could. Um, 
And then some of the things that have affected the, the evolution are, of course, uh, the, the loss, the forensics, um, notification laws. Um, that was a huge turning point in uh, cyber insurance. In the United States, 47 states now require notification for a breach, which is, which is huge. Um, the next iteration of this may be, you know, what kind of services, uh, what kind of security services are they gonna talk about? So I'll, I have that highlighted a little bit differently because we're gonna talk about that later. Um, they may be a little lacking or rough, and that all depends on your broker. So we're gonna see what happens in the next five to 10 years. Uh, hopefully there's gonna be more standards to policies, more standards in the metrics and collections on claims data, and also how much influence is the security industry gonna have? Uh, so what makes a good policy? A good cyber insurance policy covers, you know, of course, your legal damages. Uh, a big one here is the crisis services, and we're going to talk a lot about crisis services later on. Um, PCI, uh, the fines or the settlements that happen there. Um, uh, we talked about the extortion. Uh, and then some bodily injury. That's kind of a newer thing, right? Uh, if someone hacks the ICS for the robotics in your manufacturing plant and it kills somebody, is uh, you know what does that go under? You have to kind of think like that, you know. Um, education, just like most of security, education in the insurance industry with security is huge as well. That's that that goes within the insurance companies themselves, with the brokers that sell it, with the companies that want to buy it. Uh, you know, this is just something that people think, hey, I can go pick this box up off the shelf that says it's a cyber insurance policy and I can use it, but there's a lot of education still. Um, and then the way that policies are built, if any of you are familiar, well, I'll just go through. So they have what's called a tower, or they call it ladder now because tower is a sensitive word in the U.S. because of 9-11. So it's more like a pyramid, really. You have a foundation, and this foundation would be the primary insurer that's covering, let's say, a $100 million policy, and they're gonna do 40 million, 50 million, something like that. And then there's gonna be another carrier that's gonna go on top. The broker's gonna throw on another carrier, and that other carrier is gonna do 20 million. And then the next carrier is gonna do 20 million, and things like that. So this ladder of coverage is what happens. So on the first claim, it's gotta do that first 40 or 50 million before it goes to the next, okay? And typically you'll have a deductible within there. So let's say on a $100 million policy, uh, there'll be a $10 million deductible. So you gotta make sure you're paying that, and then, and then that's, how, that's how it works. So, um, and, and depending on the policy and who's insuring, there, there could be things in there that you have to look out for about what, what's not covered, and we'll go through that. So what's the goal of these policies? Of course, to reduce risk. Uh, that's, that's pretty much what insurance is for, right? Um, it needs to be created to fit your org. Uh, just like we talk about snowflakes and security and organizations, uh, same deal with cyber insurance. Um, and the quality of the policy really depends on the talent of your broker and your premium. So if your premium is really low, you're not going to, uh, you have no leverage, right? They're gonna be like, no, we're not gonna change that for you. But if there's a lot of money involved, they may work with you. Um, all policies are different. Um, the policy is gonna give you money to cover those things and we're gonna go into those claims. Uh, and of course, you know, it's the Wild West right now, right? Um, so how does it reduce the economic risk? A lot of these are coined terms from the industry, uh, but they do make sense. You know, it's for when good risk management fails. Uh, the recovery. Recovery is, is crucial. Um, just like recovering from a major cyber event, and that's why they bring in a, a DFIR team or, 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 or lawyers or different things, that money's there to help cover those things. Um, the, the really interesting stat here is the small and mid-sized businesses are hit by 62% of all cyber attacks, and 60% of them usually are known to, have, to go out of business within six months of that cyber-related event. Well, that, that's a huge impact. Um, and then, you know, coverage. There may be coverage for things like what's happening this year with the, uh, the, the IoT mess with the different botnets, okay? So how do you calculate risk? This is a snapshot of a mobile app by AIG that helps you calculate your risk. You can use this calculator, enter in a bunch of stuff, and figure out you know, how much coverage do I need. 
This is not just something in the United States. Um, and uh, I will ask your forgiveness of, of a lot of the statistics are US based because most of the cyber insurance is sold there, but I'll go into some European cases here and the things going on there. But uh, I will say an interesting stat is the US cyber insurance premiums total 1 billion right now. That's how much money is out on the table to insure US companies is some of the stats. So cyber insurance and, and Europe, right? Europe has lagged behind um, probably because of the notification laws or the lack of, okay? Um, some of the brokers that I've spoken with and other people in the industry have talked about, you know, that that's not really driving it because companies don't have to disclose. They don't have to do things. Well, that, that's changed, right? Uh, you also have the issues like we learned about last year at BotConf with kind of that decentralized nature where some of the laws and the legal issues and, you know, well, that botnet's over there. That's not really bothering us. I'm sorry. Things like that, right? So same deal with, uh, with the risk associated with uh, cybercrime. But the, we have this, uh, or you have the new NIS directive, and uh, that uh, is going to be mandatory to report breaches. So that will probably open the floodgates. And basically, in May of 2018, companies are going to have to be prepared to, within 72 hours, report a breach. And there's probably going to be a lot of cyber insurance sold within Europe to cover that kind of stuff. Um, so I wanted to talk about that. And then uh, I, I apologize. I don't know how, if it's ENISA or ENISA, or I don't know how it's said, but they, they, there's a really cool report put out there where they're prepping and talking about how to how your business can work with cyber insurance. Um, here's that report, and uh, they, that just came out this year. So uh, the governments here are getting ready for that. Uh, I don't know if it's too soon for a Brexit comment or joke, but uh, the UK government, same thing. Um, you know, they're of course uh, you see Marsh listed there. They're a major broker, um, so they're going to back that up because it's. You know, follow the money. They're they're gonna they're gonna benefit from that, but they're, they're telling you right here the role of insurance and managing and mitigating risk. Okay. All right. So, is cyber insurance for everyone? Um, no. If you are a very well-off company and you have a huge amount of cash, you can cover your own risk. Um, you know, I, I, I'm pretty sure you can probably name a few of these companies. On, on one hand, right, that, that probably don't need, or, or maybe they have uh, little sub-companies that'll have cyber insurance, but really the idea being is they can, they can handle it, right? They can handle the money. Um, but for the most part, I would say most companies probably are going to need it or, or, or will need it if they want to stay in business over time. Um, it, it's a risk issue, right? So what verticals are buying and renewing policies? And this is the part where many of you are probably yawning or wishing you could leave. Um, but we'll, trust me, we're getting into some good stuff here. It'll, it'll reach a climax. Um, <laughs> a lot of companies. Uh, as you can see, I basically put on the bottom here, have I missed anyone? And let me get into some of the, the, the stats here, right? So you can see the growth here um, from 2012 to 2014. Uh, healthcare, of course, huge. Um, power and utilities. Some of you may have worked on some of these uh, jobs where you've had to go in and, and do the work here. Um, uh, here's a stat for European uh, companies that are purchasing. So you can see some of the growth and, and, and things happening here. Of course, financial institutions uh, make sense. Retail makes sense. Manufacturing as well. Uh, I put this slide in because Marsh is so involved with the cybersecurity market as a broker, and they have a lot of the experts. They actually testified in front of the uh, Committee on Homeland Security in the United States, and they talked about how cyber insurance is going to be important to overcome the risks. And it's just interesting because some of the stats that they provide here is the growth rate and how much it's grown and where it's going. So I'm trying to back up some of these other stats I gave in the beginning to where it's going to reach this $2 trillion. Um, and you can see here. So before your eyes glaze over, I'll continue on. Uh, we have a lot of this kind of material, right? Um, the type of limits purchased. So this is in the millions, okay? So these are the limits. So a typical 
incident or event, you know, may only cost a company $10 million or up to $60 million. Uh, I have some examples where Sony fought with their insurance because they didn't have enough, things like that, right? So um, this just gives you an idea of the different sectors and what they're, they're buying for their limits. Um, how, how, does the cyber, how, do, how does cyber insurance, how does the insurance industry deal with the cyber claims, okay? So you've had these different uh, uh, coined terms like cyber liability 3.0. So what was 1.0? Um, 1.0, you know, maybe it started out with a policy of only liability, okay? And then the notification laws came in. So we're going to cover uh, the crisis, the crisis event, right? Um, you know, then they're going to add services to help a company. And next, is it going to be metrics? So right now we're in that 3.0 version, right? They're, they're adding services. They're, they're building things like calculators. They're partnering with security companies. Um, next, it'll probably be standardization and different metrics on reporting. Um, and then the next one, will it be more of the influence in the security industry? Or will they start absorbing? Uh, we'll talk about that. Um, Oh, prevention. So much like if you get a major life insurance policy, you may have to get your blood drawn and checked to make sure you're healthy. Uh, if you are a major company and you want a lot of coverage, they may send people in and check out your network. Uh, that's a good thing, right? Um, do, they play, do they pay on claims? Yes, and we're going to go through that, okay? Um, yes, mostly, and then I'll talk about some denials. So uh, the reason why I wanted to give this talk as well is I think there's a bad perception, and I was one of those people, that cyber insurance is really kind of a fraud thing and they don't pay and they, you know, they're out to, they just take your money. And you'll hear people talk about that. And, and you'll see through some of the statistics here that's not true at all. It's, it's actually they pay, they pay um, for the most part. So here's some examples of claims. I was hoping to come with a little bit more teeth uh, to some of these examples, but we all have our lawyer issues, right? Um, part of the reporting uh, issue is there's no standardization and there's no good reporting. And of course, companies don't want to say, yeah, we screwed up, yeah, we did this, right? So um, what I'll be able to provide through the rest of the talk is some of the publicly known information and a report that the industry uses about claims data. So it's anonymized claims data, but it's very detailed. And I think you'll find it quite interesting. Uh, so Sony, we know. They, they've been breached a couple times, right? Maybe more. Uh, some, a couple high profile at least. And they had a fight with Zurich uh, uh, over it and they actually settled out of court. So we don't know how much money that was. Uh, Anthem, if you're in the US and you heard about Anthem, that was a huge healthcare breach. And that's actually still in litigation, but the costs are massive. Uh, they, they continue to grow. Um, so ransomware, you know, we saw over the weekend, if you, if you saw what happened in San Francisco, the MTA, you know, we'll find out what happens with that, right? Um, hospitals with ransomware, those claims are being paid. Uh, it's, it's kind of death by slow bleeding. They're, they're onesie twosie and they're making a lot of money off of those, right? Uh, the cyber criminals. IP theft, um, Sony, again, Sony Entertainment. Second breach, they only had 60 million in coverage and that was not enough to cover it, all right? Uh, somebody leaked the documents of their actual policy uh, and I can give you the references for some of that, right? Um, so the different malware impact, uh, um, you know, I'm preaching the choir here. Many of you know, I'm just throwing this out to kind of show that, you know, in the finance industry, some of you who maybe use Tesco Bank I've had to deal with this recently, uh, manufacturing. So AF Global, they actually had to uh, sue their insurance provider, and we'll talk about that later because it was a denied claim. Um, uh, we talked about Sony and, of course, hospitality. So a lot of, uh, a lot of hospitality issues, right, with malware. Botnet, you know, Target, Target probably helped put cyber insurance on the map more than just about anything else. Um, they only had, they, they basically had a $100 million policy with a $10 million deductible, so at about a 90 million they could work with. Uh, to date right now, it's at uh, 286, I think, or something like that, so almost $300 million are the costs that they've had to uh, deal with. Um, 
So ransomware, MRI, all, all the impact, right? I'm preaching the choir on that one. So ransomware, so hot right now, right? It's a big thing. It's everywhere, year, year of ransomware. Um, the claims are actually up 400%. So that is something that uh, I am able to talk about. Uh, they are paid by the insurance industry. Uh, you'll probably see or hear um, if you decide to go to another talk about cyber insurance, that, that may, there may be some changes because of the amount of claims that are being paid. Uh, so they may get a little more strict on their policies or force more controls. Um, but the idea here is, is most criminals have provided keys, right? So they're, it's kind of a crazy thing to say, but they're being honest criminals. Um, you know, they'll, they're extorting you and then they're giving you the keys for the most part. There's a few examples where they're not, but I find it quite interesting that you now have insurance companies paying those extortions by proxy, right? And so you have cyber criminals who are actually making a living based upon the insurance coverage that's, that's happening. So there's kind of this, uh, this ladder that's being built. And, uh, you know, the work that you do here in this group, I'm, I'm pretty sure the insurance companies are going to be very interested in to see how you can do these takedowns and how you can reduce this stuff. Because basically they're helping support the development and, and the growth of the uh, ransomware industry by proxy, by paying this. That's my opinion, and that's how I see that. But um, Okay, so claims, it's, it's, hopefully this wakes you up a little bit more. Um, so I'm gonna take a lot of the claim statistic information from a, a group called Net Diligence. Um, I have no affiliation with them. They, they provide probably the most comprehensive reporting about cyber insurance claims. Um, they work with uh, you know, 17 different companies. They, um, they had 176 different claims that they could discuss in this report, which was, which was you know, pretty good. Um, and let's, let's, let's go through that. So the cost of a, an average claim, as you see, has kind of gone down. Um, I can talk about, off, after the talk about 2012, it's considerably much higher. Um, but you're looking at uh, 665,000 US dollars uh, on an average claim. Um, the uh, the breakdown of claims by business sector, I thought would, would be kind of interesting for you to see. I mean, these are the people that you're protecting, and these are the people that are buying your services um, and are having to actually file an insurance claim if something goes wrong. So um, restaurant, uh, healthcare, you see some of these bigger chunks in there. The, uh, the number of claims by revenue size, so this is, this is the interesting part, right? So if you see here, 86 claims uh, by, by revenue less than uh, 50 million. And these are probably companies that can't s afford the security services, right? They can't afford the team. They, they can't afford the shiny box. And so they're actually being impacted way more. They're having to file more claims. And that goes back to the other stat about how many of them can't recover from a major issue. So they need this insurance. So it becomes kind of the cycle, right? Um, and this, this will give you micro revenue, you, even, even less, right? So, or sorry, a little bit more, and then you're 44. Uh, and then of course, the, the mega revenue, right? Over uh, 100 billion, one, one claim, right? I think they could have probably handled it without it, but they had the insurance. Um, so the percentage of claims by revenue size, this kind of goes in, so you see half. Half of all the claims in this report are from companies that that really don't have the ability. Uh, you could probably say, well, I'd say half, and then that, that next 25% may have a, a decent security team. Um, percentage of claims by data type, um, I, I found this interesting. Of course, we could probably all assume that it would be personally identifiable information. Um, and, and then uh, trade secrets, right? That's something you don't see too much about. Uh, the average records exposed, so 2 million is the average uh, for companies. Um, it's kind of hit or miss. And of course, that's going to be skewed by the amount of uh, claims, the, the data that's sub the supplied. And then uh, the percentage of records exposed by the business sector. So a pretty good, I mean, you have a couple of outliers there with the 21 and 20%. The uh, 
the other sector sectors in the healthcare, but uh, a good a good measurement of the different exposures. Um, I had to break up the slides here a little bit, so if somebody's next to you snoring, please wake them up. It's going to get better, I promise. Uh, the number of <laughs> the number of claims by type of data. So uh, more stats for those of you into that the different things. This gives you an idea of of you know the work that you're doing and what it's trying to protect that may get exposed. Um, trade secrets. One was used for trade secrets. In fact, that trade secrets uh, was interesting because that was actually the most expensive part of the claim here that you'll see later. Um, so percentage of claims by cause of loss. This is where this, this fits this crowd a little bit better. You have here the 23% and the 21%. You have the hacker and the malware slash virus. Um, I wanted to highlight that because 44% of the claims for this report are things that you have a direct impact on with through your work or the companies that you work for, uh, through your personal research. And that is huge. That should uh, hopefully help you get up in the morning, you know, refocus. Um, this is, these are the things that will stand out to both insurance companies and, and those services. Um, you have the ability to make that impact. So let's talk about the claims by type of cost. Where does the money go, okay? 75%, and if you look back through the last few years, it's in that roughly 75% range under what's called crisis services. So crisis services, the forensics, notification, uh, the credit ID monitoring, um, legal counsel, all these things, right? The majority of the money paid out by cyber insurance covers that, okay? Remember that, it's starred for a reason. We're gonna go into that. Of course, you got your legal damages, um, PCI, Things like that, right? Um, here's the here's the hard numbers actually on that. So the the claims, how many had the crisis service costs? So forensics and uh, legal, right? They they have more than anyone. Okay. Um, the average crisis service cost. This is an interesting stat because um, you know here you have the averages three hundred fifty seven thousand, but. Um, the largest claim actually was seven million dollars on one of these for crisis services. That's a, that's a lot of money to cover that kind of data, right? Uh, the smallest was only two hundred ninety dollars. So, okay, so kind of a harder breakdown if you wanted to see kind of the median. Any of you who are, are, are big statistics junkies, math junkies, you have your max and, and things like that, but. Uh, um, it gives you an idea. Most of these maximums are in that $2 million range. Um, total costs, you know, hacker and malware virus. So you have the breakdown there and then the cost that that was. So you, in one event, the maximum was $15 million paid out because of a, a hacker-related event, right? The malware virus, you had almost $4 million from that one event. So that gives you an idea of the kind of money being paid out for this stuff, okay? Um, Here's your average payout for the claims for the, for the report. Now, what's not covered, okay? So, the value of your data or intellectual property is not covered under a cyber insurance policy, okay? Um, your lost sales are not covered. Uh, brand damage, these are things that you're gonna have to work with your broker on do other things. Uh, there are some things with state-sponsored espionage that uh, it's a little tricky, and um, that's an interesting thing that I can go into after after the report here with people who want to ask about that. Um, the problem being APT, right? That whole how are they gonna? What insurance company wants to go up against a state sponsor? Okay. Um, not all claims are accepted, so let me give you some examples. Um, for the most part, most claims are accepted, but uh, here's some known examples. Sony, their first initial problem, it was a general uh, liability issue, and they had to actually, they had to do the settlement we talked about. Cottage Health Network, they were missing a couple of patches, so the insurance company came back and said, uh, you clearly didn't patch your systems, no. That got a lot of press, so that, that was one of the things that contributed to the, kind of the negativity over it. Um, but part of me thinks, well, if they weren't patching, you know, so, so where do you draw the line, right? Uh, and then the, this AF Global Corp. So they, they actually lost a lot of money to this uh, CEO scam, 
and they had to sue their insurance provider, their cyber insurance provider. So they said, well, hey, that's why we have cyber insurance. And they said, no, no, that's, you have, you have financial controls and you're just supposed to have financial controls in place for this. So it's actually still in litigation. So the insurance company said, nope, we don't cover that because you should cover this through something else. And so these are the problems with the policies and the understandings, right? Um, property is not covered. Uh, it, you know, that's covered under a whole different policy, okay? And then the theft of money. So if they, they happen to steal money out of a bank account or they, they do other things, that, that's, that's, that's your crime policy, okay? Um, so what are they doing to reduce risk? Uh, of course, they're, they're focusing on prevention, right? It, it helps save money. Uh, yeah, the, I hope you like that stat. I love that one. Um, <laughs> cybersecurity, uh, so they're doing some ratings, right? They're partnering. Uh, they're, there's, there's companies out there that are, that are doing these health scores, these credit checks on companies. Um, the, the blocking of traffic, um, threat intel lists, um, some education. Um, so this is where it comes into the talk, right? And I really appreciate you hanging in with me through all that horrible, boring stuff. Um, you are the superheroes of this, this part of cyber insurance, okay? Your, your work directly affects this 44% from this. Um, and and I'm, not, I'm not pandering to my audience here, maybe a little bit, but, but not really. Um, the, the work that you guys do is, is huge, especially for those small to medium-sized businesses, for those businesses that can't afford their own researchers, their own analysts, their own forensics teams, right? Um, the products that you're producing, the research that you're putting out. Um, you know, it, it's essential. And I'm not saying I'm Batman, but I had to bring it back for this talk as well, Eric. All right. Now, you may have wanted to use this group of superheroes, so it's a little bit blended, but since we are in Europe, I could have used this group of superheroes. Captain Euro, I didn't even know this existed. That was pretty funny. So, um, seriously, I'm gonna leave that up there for a while. Uh, seriously, I wanna give a huge thanks uh, to all, a lot of the researchers. Uh, there are a lot of people in this room that contribute to the community. Um, you know, there, there's decryptor tools out there. there there's uh, the, the different uh, tools. Uh, I don't even know what to say because I'm afraid I'm not going to mention people who may be in the room, but there are a lot of websites, a lot of hard work that's done by people after hours on their own time, um, and there's a lot of major security companies that provide community tools to help, and, and honestly, that, that's part of that. Your unsung heroes who don't get the credit you deserve, so I, I just want to thank you for that. You guys should give yourself a round of applause, seriously, right now. This is something that, keep it up. One day you can be Captain Euro or Europa or Lupo if you want to be the dog, right? So what does this all mean? You know, why am I talking about this? Um, insurance will become more involved with security. Security companies are going to become more involved in, with insurance, and I'm going to give you some examples of that, right? We remember this. Is anyone here who works for Symantec? Are you not gonna raise your hand? Because I know there are people here who work for either Norton or Symantec, right? So this was, this was something that caused quite a bit of controversy and stir. Well, I'm gonna explain this. Last year, just before BotConf, a gentleman said that insurance companies need to start buying security companies. And I thought that was kind of an interesting take. Uh, it got disputed, but there are companies, um, I work for one uh, listed here, that is partnered strategically with uh, insurance companies. So there are already security services that are partnered. Um, Symantec has opened a cyber insurance portal. They have got into the cyber insurance market um, pretty heavily because they opened this up, joined June of 2016. You have the Symantec CI. I, I didn't know this existed until I was doing the research for this. And they have partnered with cyberpolicy.com, uh, I believe. And that is a place to go in and learn about how to set up cyber insurance, especially for small businesses, and look who their leading partners are. 
Norton by Symantec, and then you have Chubb, which is an insurance provider, and they talk about how to set all this up, okay? Well, now this makes sense. I know this caused a lot of stir as to LifeLock. Why would Symantec buy LifeLock? Well, if you remember, or you were awake during all of my pie charts and bar charts, there was 75% of the money went to what? Crisis services. And there was actually a chart in there that talked about what part of crisis services were claims related to things that LifeLock deals with. And so you have Symantec coming out and saying, uh, with the combination of Norton and LifeLock, we'll be able to deliver comprehensive cyber defense for customers, or for consumers. This acquisition marks the transformation of consumer security industry from malware protection to the broader category of digital safety. Okay? They want to build new products that leverage the analytics from LifeLock to identify those emerging threats, and again, transform from a malware protection to digital safety. So, crisis services, you know, follow the money. So I think uh, what you can learn from that is, of course, this is at the end of one of Norton's reports, go boldly, not blindly. I think that uh, when they said AV was dead, they had a plan for this, possibly, or maybe they're just having a, an interesting recovery, right? But uh, what does it all mean? Look, as the workhorses, as those unsung heroes, your research is pivotal for creating better policy for cyber insurance. Um, your organization may end up partnering with uh, an insurance company. Uh, you may end up being acquired by one. Uh, you could one day work for one. Um, we need some of you to work with the insurance industry because you have the background, you have the knowledge to help with these things. So uh, one day in your future that may happen. And also, your company's security plan may include a budget for a cyber insurance policy. Uh, are they going to spend $100,000 on a tool or some new employees, or are they going to take that $100,000 and end up getting a million dollars worth of risk coverage, right, until they can cover that, uh, that risk and implement that security control? So in conclusion, it, I think uh, cyber insurance is going to continue to influence the industry. Education is key. Um, you have to think of it as a complement, not a replacement. Uh, so, uh, so if anyone in your organization asks you about it, hopefully this talk has helped educate you a little bit on that. Um, it is measurable. There are claim statistics, there are things out there, and then the, the work that you do affects that. Uh, I would love to be able to come back or maybe report personally on the 44% going down because of some of the work that's done by people in the room or the organizations represented here. Um, you, you will continue to see the merging of companies. Uh, both security and insurance, and is your future coworker going to be one of these two? So, for those of you who took a good nap, it's time to wake up. Thank you for your time. Appreciate it. Okay, we we have time for a quick question or two. Hi, um, Fabian, still from uh, Planet Earth. Thanks for. The um, I, I personally believe that we are not just part of the solution, but also part of the problem, right? And we've seen um, companies selling single data, uh, honeypot data, and so on, uh, to insurance company. And so my question is, did you study how that, does that actually materialize into the pricing? Um, in one of my former role, I had to look at some of this data from the insurance, which was trying to actually sell um, some package to my company, and a lot of that were rubbish data, like dead botnets and stuff like that. So, you know, how does that truly? Really, how, how, how much? How much are we part of the problem as well? That's a great question. So, I brought this back up because one of the companies listed here does something similar like that, where the if someone gets an infection that phones home to one of their botnets that they've taken over. Uh, that's, a, that's a mark against them, right? And so the problem is, is that a true representation of the risk that that company has? Because, you know, potentially uh, it could have been a sales guy on the road, picked up something, you know, 
do you know the whole landscape of the company uh, versus this one IP address space that you're representing them by? So there, I agree, much like how cyber policies are evolving, I think this process is evolving, and that's why I was saying we need to have people in the room work with insurance companies because they're the ones writing the policies and paying the money on it and, and accepting that risk for a, a dollar amount. And when you are working and creating, you know, I know there's projects out there for collaborating on sinkhole data. I think uh, projects like that are projects where you're, you're gonna work on, you know, what's the actual true risk of this versus sometimes the marketing gets involved and says, no, no, we gotta, we gotta sound the alarm, the bugle, put the new logo up, happy ghost, whatever it's gonna be called, right, to talk about this and, and is it really a, what's the true impact to an organization? So. Um, I, I agree. I think I don't. I don't know if that answered your question, but I think that's a very thoughtful uh, response and question to uh, to the issues. Uh, you know, th this talk might not be the most exciting, but it, it talks about kind of the reality of the decision makers that many of us work with or work for, and and the companies that buy security services. And these are the things that influence that, right? And so, if in, if security, if you in your day to day job can improve that it's gonna be better for us all uh, and for the global economy. Uh, so thank you for the presentation, it was really, really nice. Um, what about personal cyber insurance, like, like identity theft, right? Like, because they are putting you a lot of debt and then you are doing nothing, but I know people that have to flee the country because they couldn't pay anything. So how, how do you work with that and how do you check and verify? Or? So I'm not an expert in that all. I'll say that right off the bat. I think that's why Symantec did their purchase to LifeLock uh, in the U.S. It, hello? It's criticized a bit um, because it's things that you could do on your own. Uh, it's more of an automated system and there's some things that they, they cover, but services like that may hit Europe. Uh, I don't know if there is LifeLock for Europe. Um, but the, the idea that you can freeze your credit, freeze some of the information you have, uh, you may see there'll be policies. There may be an evolution of an individual policy where you would take out, you know, I need a policy on myself and to cover any losses to where if you can't pay your bills or you can't buy the house you're waiting to buy, right? Uh, I, I think right now that's probably just something so new and there may not be a market for it. Um, you know, maybe one of you can start a company that would do that, I don't know. That was a great question. Because individually, that, that, that's probably going to be a problem. Did that answer? Did that help? Okay, thank you.